Okay, we'll hit the ground running. If this is disrespectful, those lights are just pounding me. So get over it. So I'll take them off. I'm not sure why Terry gets a chair, and I don't. I mean, he's old, but he's, what, 67? I'm 60, just because I have a 6-year-old and a 10-year-old. So that's almost comical to me. It says Pastor Ron Drosky. See, a lot, of, a lot of times we would be tempted as a person, or I might, or someone that has an audience as this, to show you my credentials so that now then you'll listen to me because I have something to say. So, yes, I am a pastor. I'm an ordained pastor. That means I can marry you or bury you. That's about it, really. Okay? So that's not impressive to me. Maybe I'll tell you a couple things about me just so you can connect. I'm a carpenter. I'm a plumber. I'm an electrician. I run heavy equipment. I have a CDL license. I sell windows for a living. Anything impress you so far? Because I'm not impressed. I'm a daddy. I'm a grandpap. I'm a man. Last Sunday, when I left here, excited to know that I would have this stage a week later. I was asked about a week and a half ago to come here and preach. Last Sunday, I left, and a lady from this church, possibly provoked by the Holy Spirit, said something to me that made me know who I am more than all them other things that I said. Because all them other things don't impress me, and I am me. This woman said, you know what you are, Ron? And the way she said that, I was nervous. I'll throw a, I'll throw a weird commercial in here. I, I write a Christian blog every morning, seven days a week. And I thought maybe she read the blog and was offended by something that I had written. By the way, when Terry said that some of you read those blogs and just ignore them, he was not talking about mine, I don't think. But this woman said to me, you know what you are? And I stood there and, and I said, what am I? She said, you're a true disciple. And I thought, ooh, that's really fun to hear. Because I know this woman, and if she thinks that, I really believe that God thinks that. I want to teach you a little bit today about being a disciple. Is there arrogance in calling yourself a disciple? Well, maybe. But is there confidence? Yes. Is there a fine line maybe you should live on? Yes. The more confident you are, the closer to arrogant you'll be portrayed. I'm gonna, we're going to show, well, let me, let me start with this. So I was mowing one of my pasture fields, our pasture fields, on Wednesday, this past Wednesday. Very connected to the Lord, because that's what I do, is connect with the Lord. I said, Lord, what do I owe these people that, I get to speak to on Sunday. And as God so often does, when you unpack his Bible, he'll answer your question with a question. So I said, what do I owe these people on Sunday? And God said, why do you feel you owe them anything? And I thought, well, here we go with another one of these things. Well, because there's going to be a whole pile of them. If you don't see me sitting up here on Sundays, I'm usually in another church preaching. This front row could hold a lot of the people in a lot of the churches that I preach in. So obviously there's adrenaline, there's excitement when I get to look around at a whole bunch of people. I can't see your eyes because of that light, but I'm looking at you. I'm not looking through you. I'm not one of them speakers that looks over your head so that I'm not nervous and concerned. There's zero nerves in me right now. None. There's nothing but adrenaline and excitement and passion. 
to do what God told me to do from that tractor seat. Because as the conversation went on, I said, well, what am I supposed to bring them? It's Wednesday, Lord, and you haven't loaded me up with something yet. Again, my comment to him, you haven't loaded me up with something, came back with a, oh, haven't I? Okay, Lord, so what am I supposed to give them? And God put on my heart, give them what you give every customer that you give when you go in their house to attempt to sell them a window, a door, siding, whatever it is. Give, give these folks the same thing you give those folks. And that comes out in two ways. I give those people the truth. Not about windows. That's an accident. And Matt, if you're here, I've said that to you before, and you know that's how I am. I give people Jesus everywhere I go. Every place I enter gets Jesus. I warned recently in something I wrote about, be careful when you put Jesus around your neck in the form of a cross on your wedding band on the sleeve of your Window World shirt, on your Window World van, on your bumper sticker, on your T-shirt. Be careful. If you're not living it, stop advertising it because you're bad advertisement. So what is it that I give to people all day, every day? I give them the truth, the truth about Jesus. So in that conversation with the Lord on the tractor, I said, so that's all I'm supposed to do is come here and give them the truth. Yes, what truth? And you know what God's answer was? I don't care. So I said, well, how about a whole bunch of it? Cool. It's what you're going to do anyhow. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to talk about a bunch of truths. When a few men prayed with me in the kitchen before we got started, one of them included in his prayer Lord, bless these folks today as Ron steps on their toes because I know him well. And I don't even know that guy that well, but he knows me. So open your Bibles to the page that you read this morning. Oh, boy, he already started on the right foot. Did we step on a toe? Did I step on anyone's toe when they didn't bring a Bible? Did I step on anyone's toe when I said go to the verse that you read this morning, the page that you read from this morning? Friends, if you don't have this in you, then it's not going to work through you. It can't. It can't change you. It can't affect you. It can't help you. You saw something take place up here that, this morning. Some people came up here because of a boating accident and a little girl. And then other people came up. A bunch of stuff out of this book that God had written for me and you unraveled in that group of people. God heard it all. That wouldn't happen if this wasn't in those people. Now, I know what we're used to most of the time. We're used to standing up, maybe not just here, but anywhere. We're used to here's the verse of the day or the verses of the day, and now we're going to unpack that. Well, I'm going to unpack this whole thing. Again, is that disrespectful? He threw his Bible on the ground. It's in here. That's why I do what I do every day. That's why I was called a disciple. You and I are called to be disciples everywhere we go. We can do other things, be other things, and be a disciple. We're called to do that. Unlike COVID... Being a disciple should be, could be, and will be, when we do it right, the most contagious thing that there is. There should be no mask. You don't wear one because you don't want to get it, and you don't wear one because you don't want to give it. As a disciple, your main goal in life is to have everybody get what you got. 
And God will use different things to make that happen. We're going to run through a couple slides. I went through my phone, and I didn't realize how many thousands of pictures I have. And with my 2.0 reading glasses, I'm still looking funny. I mean, not my appearance. But what I see because of this, I just want, what we're going to do is we're going to give you about five seconds per photo. And I just want you to mess with your emotions as you look at these pictures. Five's too long. Let's make it four. Oh, look at that one dove sitting all by himself. wonder what that's about. Is there a storm in your life? Are you cold? Ah. Oh. That's a piece of seaweed coral I took that through. Uh-oh, hang on. Sit. There's my flat tire with scripture all written above it. Look at the roots fighting for dirt on that one. Look at that. Wow, we're different in life, aren't we? Honey, turn the fan on. I took that in Somerset. Uh Uh-oh. Relax, it's a dolphin. Okay, where'd your emotions go with all those? There were highs, there were lows. We are emotional beings. God wants us to fear him because of the boundaries that he has set, which he did to protect us, to protect those around us, to be a good witness to him. And what's he going to do that's going to make us correct Be corrected. Tyken, sit down. Jack, sit down. See, I played the role of God there in that skit. God is going to correct you. He's going to straighten you out. And he's going to do that too. And he's going to do that right after he scolded you. Friends, stop having fear of God and calling it reverence. Stop thinking that God is unapproachable. Get the image of the word father out of your head from possibly your father. My dad was and is very, very stern. He's 88. He doesn't mess around. I grew up with fear of my dad. We had horses when when I grew up, and there was a time when I went and took the plug out of the horse trough and scrubbed all the algae off the sides, and I went and fed the horses, Typically, I go back, and I put the plug back in, and I turn the pump on. When it fills up, I unplug it, and we're good to go. There was a day I walked about three-quarters of a mile from the bus stop home. There was a day when I come up over the hill, and I saw all the horses that we boarded at our place. I grew up on, on kind of a little farm in Monroeville, believe it or not. All the horses were standing around looking at the water trough. Uh-oh. So I ran and changed real quick, and I ran down and put the plug in and plugged it back in. 
and there were some discussions in horse language with those eight horses as to who's drinking first. I brought that up to my daddy at the dinner table. And dad slid my milk away and said, in 24 hours you can have liquid, not until then. I was a senior in high school. Now let me ask you, did I fear my dad the next day when I had the most intense migraine I thought a human could have in school while walking right past a water fountain did I fear my dad by not taking a drink? Yes. I was convinced my dad had hidden cameras in the whole entire planet. And you know what caused that? Conviction. If I took a little tiny sip, I'm going to take one right now. If I took that much of a sip in school, uh, I am... Guaranteeing I would have went home and told my dad, I took a drink today. That's just who I was. That's fear. That's good. That kind of fear is really, really good. But that same exact daddy is the one that I would run up to oftentimes to tell him something awesome that happened. You and I are supposed to live that same way. We are supposed to have the fear of God 56 times, give or take, depending on the version that you want to use, 56 times in in the Bible. The word fear is used explicitly and in detail, talking about you and I and God. It, It tells, the Bible tells us so many times that we are to fear God. God. How many times does it tell us to not be afraid? 144. Which, what do we do now? 50 sometimes we're told to fear him, and then 144 times. Do we just do the math and say, well, it's kind of a three to one, we're just going to pick this one? No, we're to do both. We're to do both. The respect that God should get from us is earned. Unearned reverence is fake. Unearned respect is fake. It's usually known. There are people that you act like you respect. There are people that you work with or that you're related to, and you act like you respect them, and they know, just like that little puppy we put up there first, that's our little beagle. They know like a dog how fake you are. You mean I can just voice command whatever picture I want? That's crazy. (laughs) I'm not used to all this automation. God is no different when the word respect is used. God knows your heart anyhow. So if you don't fear him, one of two things is taking place. Either you don't know him or you're just choosing not to fear him because you don't know who he is. You You don't think he's as powerful as he is. Let me ask. Can you mix karma in with God? No. If you think you're blessed because you're holy, then you didn't live the first 40 years of my life. There wasn't a holy thing about me. Zero. Oh, I went to church. I actually sat in the front row as an adult my whole life. My reason was, because of you guys, actually, clicking your pen, picking your nose, sleeping, doing all kinds of things. It was such a distraction to me. I wanted to hear what was going on. I'm not going to blame my previous denomination for what didn't happen, but nothing happened. 
We just played church. But you know what? I was blessed that whole 40 years. Some of y'all think you've been blessed because God changed your life, and then he started blessing you. He took care of a little girl's toes because we prayed it. He took care of somebody in here that has cancer. There, there's more stuff in this room this size than, than we can imagine. If there was a little clear bubble, a hologram above everybody's head in here, and, and something had to go in that, something that's going on in your life had to be in that bubble, there would be a lot of wild stuff going on in here. There's people in here agonizing and hurting because of adultery, because of cancer, because of finances, because of accidents. If you think God's going to bless you because you come to him, if, if, if anyone has ever told you, come to Christ, come to Jesus, as we'll talk about here in a little bit, y'all need Jesus, you should get him because then you're going to get blessed and everything's going to be wonderful. Then I'm going to ask you right now, throw that all out because it's a flat-out lie. You get sold out for Christ, you better hang on because it's going to get upside down. It's going to get worse than it ever was. You call that a blessing? Yes, I call that a blessing because now you have the one to get through all those things. But was I blessed for 40 years without Christ? You tell me. There were a couple times in my life there was a pistol put against the side of my head. Once the safety was clicked off, once the hammer went back. I'm standing here today. Neither time did I deserve to be shot for anything that I had done. I have to throw that in there. But there's about a thousand times when that should have happened for stuff that I did do. God has cured so many things in my, in my body, in my relationships, in my failures, before I ever knew him. Whether you want to believe it or not, God is the God of everybody. I'm not talking outside what God's word says. Every single human on this planet is a child that God made. Everyone. Not everyone's going to be adopted. He wants to adopt every person. Every single one. He wants to. He filled out the application. Did you guys see that application? It's called Jesus hanging on a cross. He wants to adopt every human that ever breathed air in and out. Because he's God and I'm not, I'm not going to answer you as to why he did it the way he did it, where you now have to make that choice. I don't know. You want a spiritual explanation? You want me to get the Bible and show you all kind of verses it can show you? Well, God is God for a reason. There's a whole bunch of stuff we don't understand. Stop trying to understand everything you don't need to understand. Heaven. Seems to be the new thing. People are talking about heaven so much. There's movies and books, and we're, heaven's going to be over-explained, and then y'all are going to get there and say, wow, that's really different. We've painted and pictured and charcoal pencil Jesus so many different ways, and when you meet him, is your first impression going to be, oh, my goodness, you don't even look anything like that. You want to see his face right now? Die. Because that's the only way you're going to see it. And when you do, you're going to become a believer. Whether you know him as your Lord and Savior or not, every person on this planet will become a believer. Unfortunately, another thing he put in his book, become a believer before you die, it's good. Become a believer after you die, that's bad. Now let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk about what it means once we become a believer. What should be happening different? That disciple thing I talked about in the, in the beginning. What's that look like? What's a disciple look like? What's a disciple act like? Well, this is what one looks like. I know three more in the front row there. A disciple looks like somebody that's willing to talk about Christ because they're excited about Christ. A disciple is somebody that is following. 
somebody. If you look up the word disciple, that's what it means. Oftentimes, depending on how you look that up, it, it will talk about Jesus. But John the Baptist had disciples. There were others that had disciples. They were followers of Jesus' followers. None of us in this room are called to be disciples of anyone other than Jesus. Can we follow alongside with people that are following Christ? Yes. And we better. We should. That's why we're here today. We're called to get together as a group. And that's what we did today. We did it for a lot of different reasons. I wish sometimes I could interview. I thought about, oh, oh I thought about all kinds of things. You can't imagine what I thought about. I thought about putting my cell phone number up there and standing here with my cell phone and just asking for random questions or things about the lives of the people that I'm looking to and talking to. And God said, yeah, that's stupid. So that's why we didn't do that. But a disciple's ready to do that. Can you see why I thought that? A disciple's ready to do that. A disciple isn't someone that can get a pop quiz and answer every question that's in that Bible. We're going to disagree on things. Four very godly men stood with me in that kitchen and prayed. I have no doubt in my mind that they see things differently. There is no doubt in my mind. If you went all the way down through doctrine, those men are not eye to eye on every subject that we could talk about. God did not ask us to be robots. God didn't ask us to give what he wants us to give all the same way, and he didn't ask us all to receive. But one thing I can tell you, if we took that slide back there that's, that's in between the kitchen and, and this room here, that, that roll, roll away garage door kind of thing, if we lifted that up and served food, how many different ways are there to serve that food? Some of you that were in the military, some of the, you that may, maybe even in school. And you went to the cafeteria. They didn't have cafeterias when you went to school, Jack, but the rest of the people will understand what I'm talking about. So you went to school and, 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 and you went up with a tray. And, and they, they plopped stuff on it. This is here. Here. That's a lot of churches. Oh, then there are the other ones where you're going to sit down and you're going to get an appetizer. Then you're going to get your meal. Then you're going to get dessert. You see where I'm going? There's all kinds of different styles and ways. There's styles and ways you're comfortable with. But let me tell you from experience, 20 years experience this December, because that's when I became a disciple. That's when I became a follower. And I hit the ground running when I became a, a follower. I started seeing everything different. My hunger and my passion was, Lord, change me. The first thing I said was, Lord, change me. I, I think God got the biggest smile he did in a long time when I said that. Because he was ready for that for most of those 40 years. He just was waiting for me. And he's got time. I'm going to grab something over here. So what if I was standing somewhere, like I saw a guy under a bridge in Butler, dressed nice, and he had a, he had a sign that said, Disabled Veteran Needs Help. It made me think of this. Well, not, a, not instantly, uh, I'll tell you. My first thought was, I just drove past 40 signs that say, need help. And now he's saying there, it says, need help. I'm like, well, go on places that says, need help, and do something. Wash their dishes or do something. That was my first thought. Then I spiritualized myself. Disabled Christian, need help. This is what I see. A lot of the places that I go 
when I do my job. I'm asked to come to people's homes and give them an estimate. I see this because I talk about Christ. Let me encourage you in one way. If you're doing your job or you're living your life, some people are, are, aren't working, they're, they're past that, and they're doing other things. If you're doing your life and you go anywhere, even to your Facebook page, you go anywhere and you see a person, I want you to find out if they're holding this sign up. Because I see this sign all day long. I don't go in people's homes and take Jesus with me. I've never done that. However, I follow him in the door. So if you want to tell me, well, I'm not allowed to do that, or I can't do that, or that's not appropriate where I work, well, I dare you to tell Jesus when you get to work, you wait right here. I'll be back at 5. Oh, that's my little commercial to encourage you to talk about Christ. Because this is what I see all day long. I wish I brought the marker that Jennifer made this with and I could put it in here. Future. Disabled future Christian needs help. Because that's the other group of people that I face all day are people that just look at you. But friends, if you're a disciple and you're a follower of Jesus and you're connected to God's Word and it's in you, then he'll get it out. I don't have the attention span Well, Kier's attention span is twice as long as mine. Put it that way. I don't have an attention span. I don't have a memory anymore. I can't remember stuff. There's a young man sitting back there that I work with. He calls me oftentimes through the day to ask me a question. He's, he's been with this job of almost a couple years, so he'll call me because I'm the senior guy that knows some stuff, and he'll, he'll ask a question, and I, I'm like, I don't know. How do you do this job if you don't know? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm not that different when it comes to God's Word. I read that Bible every single solitary day. I've done it for 20 years. I didn't put it down until I read the whole thing through and through when I first got saved. And I have no clue how many times I've read it. I read my Bible this morning for me, not for you guys, not for anything that has to do with today. Fortunately, no one's yelling out, what would you read? Or show us what verse you read today. Because I can't remember. But God said, you put it in and I'll get it out. And I promise you that is the truth. And this is, this is the sign you should be carrying. Relatively detailed, exactly like that. Imperfect, forgiven Christian, available. That's who you are. Okay? If you don't have this, when they show you this, whether it says disabled Christian needs help or disabled future Christian that needs help, if you don't have this, you can't help them with this. You can't. And you should be. We're called to that. Which side should I put out? That one. We're called to do that. We're called to be that. Friends, the veil was torn in half. Do we know what that means? Do we know what that means when Jesus died on a cross and God put in his word for a reason that the veil was torn in half? He put that in there so that you and I can now approach his throne like Tykin and Kiara did when they came up here to hug me and say, I love you, Daddy. I'm really shocked. That was planned. It wasn't rehearsed, but that was planned. I'm really shocked that one of them didn't whisper, can we get ice cream on the way home? <laughs> or something. And that would have been so cool. That's what a daddy wants. I want a little kid to say I love you. But he also wants to be respected. Had Tyken done that with Jack, 
And that will be set up. Or even me to tell Jack that I'm going to tell you to sit down and that's what you're going to do. And Jack's like, all right. Which I was surprised. I was kind of expecting a fight from him. But if that wasn't rehearsed and we would have had that, he would have had words with me. Because he's a manly man. And he's a godly man. And he's not afraid. But he's afraid of God. Or is he? He's not. I know the man. That's why I picked him today. And I'm not saying be more like Jack. I'm saying be more like who God wants you to be. Have fear and respect of God because of who he is. And then get over the part of the fear that you added into that. Stop being afraid to go to your heavenly father. That's why he's called the father. That's why the prayers in our house start when those little kids pray with, thank you, Father God. We call it the Lord's Prayer. Or they, whoever they are, call it the Lord's Prayer. It was Jesus teaching us how to pray. Our Father. Jesus said, Our Father. He didn't say, Your Father. He didn't say, My Father. He said, Our Father. That's why my kids start their prayer with Father God. Thank you, Father God. Every time we pray in our house, it's thank you, Father God. It's hysterical sometimes because they scramble for something to thank them for. If we had a bad day or a lot of crazy stuff went on, they thank them for getting through the day. Thank you, Father God, that Dad didn't beat me when he was really screaming all day. I've heard some pretty crazy things. God wants you to approach his throne as you are, simply as you are. Some of y'all are afraid to do that because you're carrying so much luggage and junk, you can't get up the steps to him. And he's standing looking at you saying, "Put put it down. That's what repentance is. Repentance is putting it down, leaving it go. So put it down and approach the throne. We have a very forgetful God when it comes to your sins. The enemy has abused us and you in reminding you about all your stuff. And for some reason, and I don't have the reason, God isn't saying, ignore him, I'm standing here. Well, maybe he is doing that because maybe that just resonated with somebody in here today. God loves you and he wants to talk to you. And he wants you to love him constantly, not occasionally, not when you're going to eat, but when you're driving your tractor or when you're having a good day or a bad day or any day. When you wake up, he wants to talk to you. Those kids get up. Not all the time. Most of the time, those kids get up. They're going to run and find out where Daddy is sitting writing his blog. Do you think I've ever went like that and said, I'm writing here? Well, the answer is yes, because I'm me. I'm not God. But do you think, seriously, do you think that God ever, ever, ever would say, too busy, too busy? Got a lot going on today. We got this thing going on with the little girl in the hospital. We got this cancer over here. We have, we have this trouble in marriage here. We got all this financial. That's not God. God is yours. He's yours personally and individually. He has time for every single. You know why there are no clocks in heaven? Because there's no time. He got time. He has time. And what are you doing? You saw the emotions go on with some prayer today here. I watched Carrie, who I don't know how she sings in full smile mode most of the time. It's like she's posing for a picture and singing. I have no clue how she does that. Today, she didn't do that. She was fighting tears and emotions that whole last song. So you watch that, and then you want to what? You want to process process that, and you want to say, well, 
geez, all I wanted to do was talk to the Lord and tell him I love him, and then I wanted to tell him it would be neat if I could catch at least one big fish today. But he's too busy with that. The God of this universe is yours individually. He's big enough to handle that hospital situation and your big fish desire. Reminds me of a sign that said, it's better to be fishing thinking about God than in church thinking about fishing. That's funny, but listen, take God everywhere you go. Go to God everywhere that you are. He's approachable. He, he's no different than, than me when you saw them little kids run up, instantly reaching for you. I could have been furiously mad at one of them for something that they did maybe recently, and I still would have done that. Your emotions can push you all over the place. I'm asking you to push, use them to push you towards the Lord. I think of a time recently when I was writing the blog. Tyken came up and sat against me, and he leaned over, reading as I was writing, one thumb on the phone. And another dog that we have, a coon dog, walked past, and Tyken called him, Eight times, her, called her eight times, and she ignored him until the point where I stopped and I said, stop untraining this dog as fast as we're training it. You cannot call that dog and not make it listen. And Tykin stood up and said, whatever he said, I don't know, but that's all I heard, and that was enough for me to say, now go get the paddle, because you're not talking back in our house. So he went and got the paddle that has scripture on both sides. We're spiritual beaters. <laughs> Tyken showed up, and I said, give me, give me the paddle. And he did, and I said, put your hand out. And he just looked at me. I said, put your hand out. And he went like that. I said, turn it over. And he goes like that. And I put the handle of the paddle in his hand. I said, now paddle yourself. You can't paddle yourself very hard, I found out. So he did this little thing and he hit himself. He's crying furiously this whole time. And I said, did you paddle yourself hard enough? And he said, no. I said, yeah, that was good enough. Put it away. He went and hung the paddle up. And then he came back and he sat down next to me and he leaned against me and he said, I love you, daddy. And I told that story for two reasons. One, because the Bible says, discipline your kids. So those of you that have fear of that, because of our world, well, look at your kids. I'll rest my case with that. So the second reason is because I'm asking you to be like Tykin. When you get paddled, when, when God spanks you, when, when God corrects you, and you know when that is, that's called conviction, not guilt. Guilt comes from the enemy. Conviction comes from a connection with God where he's going to say to you, what are you doing? Or what aren't you doing? Or why are you doing what you're doing? Or whatever he's going to say to you. It comes in so many forms. Conviction is awesome. And then there's repentance. And then there's running back to daddy and saying, I love you. And it's over that quick. And oh my goodness, are we missing out on that. Here, you better come up. I'm going to run out of stuff to say, and the clock keeps ticking, and some people are hungry. I can hear bellies grumble. You know, you wouldn't have that ability or capability to go right to the Lord unless it wasn't for Jesus. The Old Testament people, the people that we read about, All the way up to there, they, they, they couldn't, they didn't have what we have. 
Why are you, why are you born? Let's put you being born right before Revelation. Just because. Why, why are you born right here? Why are you and I here now? I don't know. Because God decided it. But you are. And Jesus was given as a sacrifice to pay for your sin and my sin. So he died. If you were one of the disciples then, you'd, you would go like this. They all did. And when you see him show up one day, you're like, oh, you're back. That had to be the coolest thing. See, I experienced that. Because he was dead for 40 years of my life. And I'm not, can you do that background stuff that they do in all like the big time churches? That'd be fun. Oh, this is cool. I never get that stuff. So, see, that happened to me. I'm just going to tell you the fastest version of my testimony I can. Jesus was dead on a cross for the 40 years that I sat in a church. And, it, and at age 40, when God decided, I'm done with this boy. I'm killing him or saving him. And that was a two-month period of almost death. Friends, I can't be more alive than I am right now. I couldn't be. And that started 20 years ago when he walked back in. He knocked on the door. That shows up in so many different forms. If that's happening to you today, if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, then I'm not going to say he's knocking because maybe he's not knocking. Maybe you're not ready. Maybe you're here because somebody said, hey, you're going with me to church. And you said, all right. But maybe you are ready. You have to decide that. Don't let a pastor or a church decide that. Don't let a teachable method of salvation do that. God's word is clear about salvation. Clear. You don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're out. You know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're in. There's the whole gospel. People take hours and hours to do that. It's that simple. What's complicated is when he is in, what you do between then and when you actually get to see him and say, well, you look different than I thought. Those are the years that you're, you're in right now. If he's your Lord and Savior, those are the years that you're in. Surprise, ready for a really weird news flash. There's people all around you that aren't in. And they're dying and dying and dying. God's responsibility to get them to heaven. God's responsibility. The Holy Spirit's job to convict them, not yours. Stop convicting people. Let the Holy Spirit convict them. Just share the good news of Jesus. You do that often enough, when they become convicted, guess who's the first person they're going to run up to and say, hey, hey. Oh, there's nothing more exciting when my phone rings. And it's a number I don't know. I answer all my calls. I, it's a commission job. I'm going to answer the phone. The most exciting call I get is, follow-up question about Jesus or a hey guess what happened to me I drive my van with tears in my face a lot please understand this isn't pride this isn't me saying be more like Ron there's one of us actually there's three my dad and my son are both named Ron too but don't, I don't want anyone to be like me. I want you to be like who God wants you to be. I'm just asking the question right here. Are you, are you being like God wants you to be? Are you contagious? Are you spreading the love that Jesus has for you and you have for him and trying to get everybody around you to catch it? Let's, 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 let's take Jesus, the exact opposite 
of how we as a nation took COVID. I say we as a nation because I'm one of them rebellious, non-mask wearing, radical. Either get it and die or whatever. Don't even care. If you have Jesus, whatever. Don't do that. Don't clap because that'll be all weird. This is taped and then I'll get in trouble or something. Listen, Christ loves you. Jesus died on a cross for you. God decided that. The Jews didn't. Pilate didn't. The Pharisees didn't. A whole bunch of people were thrown under the bus for that. Maybe it's time I just tell a secret. God decided it. Holy smokes, is that weird? God decided to kill his own son so you would be free forever? That's intense. The coolest part about it, he decided it and he did it. And there's emotions that tie with that. And then he said, All right, you're back. I paused there just to show you what the, that three day, that three day Jesus was dead three day thing. I don't know where he went and what he did. I'm really glad he did whatever he did though. And I'm really glad he came back. And I'm really glad he's alive in my life. And I hope he's alive in yours. Father God, I thank you for this crowd of people today. I thank you for the overtime that we went and all their lunch dates being all messed up now. I just ask that whatever I had to say today that was from you, that it just goes in through the veins of these people, through the minds and the hearts and is used in a mighty and a powerful way. Lord, the stupid stuff that I came up with, just erase all that from their memories. I'm glad you're that powerful. Bless us today, whether we love you or don't love you yet, bless us, Lord. Those that don't know you yet, Lord, keep them alive. I don't care what ailment comes upon them. Cure it. Maybe let them know that was you so they can approach your altar humbly and meet you. I pray that in Jesus' name.